portals. Portals are a, an entrance, a doorway, a device for going into buildings, sometimes elaborate, and then you can have the body's portals where diseases and other things come into your body. And then the word was used in relation to the World Wide Web as an entrance to the World Wide Web. And you often talk about setting up a portal and so on. And it's an idea which has long interested me, I think, well before I really had heard of the word. Because it's a device for moving from one reality to another reality, often imagined. And so when, as a child, I read books like C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and went in with the children through the wardrobe into a parallel world of Narnia, or when I read uh, Alice uh, in Wonderland, she entered Wonderland through a portal down a rabbit hole, and uh, she entered Looking Glass World through a looking glass. These, and more recently, famously, Harry Potter going through Platform 8 and 3 quarter, these are portals. They're a device also used in many novels, uh, in films, in animations, famously by Miyazaki, the Japanese animator, spirited away, they go in through a tunnel into a parallel world. And uh, Totoro, they go down the roots of a huge tree. And the idea always is that you are here and now. We live in a fairly predictable, maybe boring, regulated, rational sort of life as um, grown-ups and even as children. But from time to time, we go into another more magical and alternative world. Another famous description is by John Keats, the po poet. The poets often use portals. And in an ode, the whole of the Ode to a Nightingale, a lovely poem, My heart aches and a drowsy numbness dim, dims my sense and so on. And then it ends by coming out of the portal that he's conjured. Uh, and he refers to uh, opening magic casements on fairy lands forlorn. So magic casements, a casement being a window. So <clears throat> very often in literature, in painting and elsewhere, we conjure up, and that's a conjuring, of course, is magic. We make a magical alternative in our imagination to this world. And what I've realized over my life is the importance of this activity. At first, I thought it was just children's stories and a bit of poetry that I liked. But increasingly, as I've thought about my life, and particularly when I wrote a book called Modernity and Enchantment, or the other way around, and I realized that much of my life has been concerned with the problem of how we escape from what Max Weber calls the iron cage of rationality, or what uh, William Wordsworth, the poet, described in his poet, poetry about growing up into the light of common day, when all the magic and uh, specialness of the world and our relations with animals and trees fades away into cost-benefit analysis. And so I've been concerned with that loss as I grew up in my own life. And then when I went to Nepal, a, a shamanic village in the Himalayas, I discovered I'd gone through a portal. The time travel that you do as an anthropologist moving from our time and space into something parallel had taken me through Kathmandu and Pokhara up to this village. And there I was in a parallel world where they believed in witches, where there were shamans who fought with evil spirits, where there were ancestors in the far place. It was where the rocks contained little gods and, and the trees likewise. 
I was in my childhood world in a way where things were not separated. And I'd done this through the portal of anthropological travel. And the same thing happened again when I went to Japan. Gradually, mysterious things happened, and I realised that on the surface Japan was a very modern, efficient, capitalist society. But beneath it, there was a parallel world of kami, spirits, and forces, and geomancy, and ancestors, and so on. And so that was a great shock and surprise and delight. And the same thing happened again when I went to China. Increasingly, China is, looks very modern and feels very modern. But below it, there is this ancient, ancient world of Taoism and ancestor worship, Confucianism, Buddhism of a special kind, so that it is an enchanted garden, as Max Weber described it. And so I'd entered through another portal, and I began to realise that nearly all people in most of the world, South America, Africa, Asia, live in a different way to the kind of Puritan, rational, Protestant way I'd been brought up myself. And then I looked again at my own world, and with it the idea of enchantment going into worlds which had a parallel existence and parallel uh, sets of laws which were different from ours, like science fiction, um, which is another device for entering into parallel worlds. And I, in doing this, I suddenly realised that my life was just filled with portals. I just had to, uh, in the old days, um, raise a, a gramophone um, needle and put it on a record and now, of course, just turn on whatever device I've got. And suddenly, uh, the first bars of any of my favourite music, from Bach and Handel through to Dire Straits and the Beatles, and I'm in a parallel world. So music is a, a portal, um, and the first few notes denote that. The same with art. I'm not a great appreciator of art, but there are a few painters, uh, Leonardo, Goya, and so on, who suddenly... I look at it and suddenly I'm in that landscape, which is not this landscape. It's, in all these forms, it's what's called a willing suspension of disbelief. I know, it's like children's games, it's let's pretend. I knew, I know it's not absolutely the same as my life, but it's just as real in another way. I've, it's been constructed by my imagination and other people's imaginations, but it's and um, it, so it's very real, but it's also different from what I do. And then, as I extended my thoughts on this, I realised that it applies to so many things, not just the arts, as I've mentioned, but all forms of games. The moment you get onto a football field or a cricket field, or even you watch these games, you are in a parallel universe. As soon as you have a, a drink of a nice drink of wine or whatever it is, as soon as you fall in love, as f soon as even you have interesting conversations with people, you are carried off into parallel existences, often richer. And so most of our life is going down through portals. In my garden, it's going round the garden, and, of course, our dreams, eight hours or more of our life, is in dreamland, which is another kind of portal. So I feel that without these oases of meaning and richness and otherness, these bubbles of imagination, we would all lead very, very boring and uninteresting lives. And so the encouragement of our imaginations to construct portals of all sorts of kinds through arts and games and play and friendship seems to me the main function indeed now of our educational system and our cultural system and I was very fortunate to have imaginative mother and grandparents who encouraged me and didn't discourage me and the same in my boarding schools so have a good time down whatever 
your portal is.